All right, so thank you for joining us this evening. We are really excited to share a little bit more about the traveling school with you all and celebrate Gracie and Mary's experiences with us and then also welcome you into our community and hopefully answer all of your questions um, and allow you some space to just envision yourself or your daughter with the traveling school. Um, so I'll start off just by introducing myself. I'm Maddie Johnson. I'm the recruiting and marketing coordinator with the traveling school, but also was a faculty. I taught literature and global studies back in 2019. I was Gracie's teacher, um, and I'm excited to be more on the back end now of making semesters come to life in the field. And over to you, Gracie. Hi, um, I'm Gracie. I was a part of TTS semester 34. I spent the fall semester of 2019 in Southern Africa. Um, and I'm super excited to talk to you guys tonight. And I'm her mom and very uh, envious that she was able to experience this incredible trip, but it was a fabulous experience for her. And we're really happy to be able to share our experience with traveling school tonight. Great, thank you both. Um, so we'll hope to keep this conversation intimate and um, fairly short, keeping it to about 40 minutes. We'll go over some nuts and bolts of the traveling school for folks who have less familiarity with what we do. And then of course, spotlight Gracie and Mary's stories and then turn it over to you all for a question and answer session. Um, know that, yeah, between both Gracie and Mary, and then also me being in the field, we have a breadth of knowledge and can answer all sorts of questions um, that you might have. So I wanted to start off by sharing a quote from Chris Emden, who is an associate professor of um, education at the Columbia Teachers College in New York City. He shares at the beginning of his TED talk from 2013, that right now there are students watching teachers try to make sense of standards, trying to engage students in the most disengaging ways possible. Right now, there are students who are trying to come up with ways to convince their moms and dads that they're very, very sick and can't make it to school tomorrow. On the other hand, right now, there are amazing educators who are sharing information, information that is shared in such a beautiful way that students are sitting at the edge of their seats, just waiting for a bead of sweat to drop off the face of this person so they can soak it all up, all of that knowledge. And Chris's thesis across this TED Talk, which you, if you haven't seen it yet, um, you should, but it is essentially saying that the triad of compelling storytelling and master narrative building and magical engagement is what makes powerful educators. And he goes on in this TED talk to say that powerful education in this triad of storytelling and narrative building and magical engagement is in his life more present in barbershops and rap concerts and black churches and in many of today's schools. And he then says that education is not just memorization, it is the activation of the imagination and a path towards liberation. Um, and I hope you appreciate this quote as much as I do. I think it's not only really relevant to today's world of education and especially the past couple of years of COVID education and more virtual education, um, but it's also a big reason why Gennifrey Hartman founded the Traveling School. She wanted to bring education to life. She wanted to make the discussions that were happening in classrooms feel more relevant and engaging. Um, and she also wanted teachers to be more than just the teachers in a four wall classroom. Um, she wanted them to get to know her, their students as humans, as the co-traveler on a long van ride and as you know their belay partner or their teammate on a rafting expedition. So with that, um, what is the Traveling School? Our mission is to amplify girls' voices through transformative education with the goal of igniting positive change. And we do that with this 
epic road trip across a different region. Um, for the past 17 years, we've operated in Southern Africa, South America, New Zealand, Central America. Um, and now for the first year ever, we are programming in our own backyard, the Western US. And it has been really exciting to launch our first semester here this fall. So in 15 weeks, we bring cohorts that range in size to right now five different states. Um, we'll have four teachers alongside them. They are all living out of one backpack um, and they're unplugged from technology. So they don't have their cell phones, they don't have laptops, they're handwriting all of their assignments, they're studying by headlamp um, and their classrooms are infinite. And that is the magic. And that is why we think of ourselves as a verb. We are constantly redefining classrooms and classmates and teachers in this idea of home. Um, we're allowing our students to connect to new places with a critical eye and open mind. We are helping them feel inspired to ignite positive change upon returning home because of the things they've seen, the conversations they've had, the people they've met, and the places that have really brought to life their curriculum. So home can look a lot of different ways and Gracie um, can look at some of these pictures and remember that that was her tent that she slept in or that was her cabin that she slept in. We are on the move, um, which means that yes, we are traversing from in this case, Montana down to Arizona, um, but we are not moving every single day. So you will be able to establish a home base at a certain campground or a ranch. Um, our average is usually five to eight days where you're in one place. But when you're trekking, for example, you might be moving campgrounds every single day. Um, so your home could be a, a campground. It could be a small town hostel. It could be a backcountry cabin. It could be some more rural towns or even homestays. Um, it could look like vast mountain ranges. It could also look like sandy riverbanks on the side of the river that you just spent the day rafting or canoeing. And with all of this, we are for the first year ever again, diving into some epic landscapes. Um, for the fall semesters, we're starting in Bozeman, Montana, going up towards uh, Yellowstone and Glacier National Parks. Then we'll be coming down through Jackson Hole, Wyoming, exploring Grand Teton National Park um, and getting to know some of the stories of indigenous peoples there and also um, public land use and sovereignty and um, local issues like the housing crisis. In Utah, we will visit Bears Ears National Monument, go rock climbing on red rock slabs, um, and then cross over the border into Southern Colorado where we'll be doing citizen science projects, perhaps observing elk for science class or um, collecting data on birds while you're trekking. You'll also be whitewater rafting on some beautiful rivers arcing between actually the Utah and Colorado borders. And then you'll finalize your trip in Arizona where you'll get to do some community service projects with the Navajo Nation. You'll head really close to, if not right at the Mexican border and have critical conversations about immigration. And um, again, what sovereignty looks like for different nations. Um, and of course, threading together as interdisciplinary as possible, all of the themes that you've been studying thus far. Spring will hit the same places just in reverse to help you follow the sunshine and not give you too much of the the western winter um and yeah so you'll start in arizona and then end around may in montana all the while you will be tackling these courses you'll be taking three honors level classes um, honors natural science honors history and politics honors literature and composition global studies and PE and independent life skills. Um, so yes, you will still be doing gym class. It just will be a little bit different than running around an indoor track. Um, instead, you might be doing early morning yoga or going for a jog. Um, you might also be rafting, rock climbing, uh, trekking, and all of that counts as PE. Our four pillars at the traveling school are 
able to come to life in some form really every day. So we are looking to immerse our students into the cultures of the regions that they're traveling through. Um, this could look like homestays, getting local guides to partner with you on an expedition, um, doing community service or engagement. And it also looks like getting guest lectures. Um, if you have a great conversation with the owner of the campground that you're staying at and realize that they have infinite knowledge about the region that you're in, they will then perhaps get invited to dinner and share a story about the content that you're learning in history class. Um, that can look a lot of different ways. It could be as spontaneous as that. It can also be more curated. Just a couple of weeks ago, our group uh, right now got a lecture from Betsy Quammen, who wrote the book American Zion, and she was someone that we reached out to, you know, months ago to um, to provide a guest lecture. So really, it's it's understanding that our four teachers are not the experts in every every place that they're going or every story that they're sharing, um, but they really want to amplify and center the voices of the people who live in those regions and know it really intimately. Um, this threads into place-based academics. We write all of our curriculum. Um, we take pride in all of our curriculum and we work on making our curriculum feel really different. We, again, involve guest lectures as much as possible. We'll have interviews as a part of research projects um, and all of our classes and projects are as experiential and place-based as we can make them. Outdoor leadership, another component. Um, we will be getting you outside, whether it's sleeping in a tent while you're in a more structured um, daily schedule or you might be on the move through the mountains, through the canyons um, on a daily basis. And that I think is just part of the magic. It is extremely empowering to get cohorts of young women feeling confident living out of a backpack and starting backcountry stoves and cooking meals for themselves um, while having it all be school. And then lastly, intentional community, which I'm sure Gracie will get to and I can speak to as well just as a faculty, but the reality is that our semester school is the smallest. We have just sometimes as few as nine, 10 girls and sometimes as many as 18 girls. Our magic number is between 10 and 14. Um, and we don't just accept anyone. We really want our cohorts to feel intentional. We want our girls to be able to leave semester feeling like they at least gain sisters, if not best friends um, and folks that will forever support them, teachers who will forever become their role models um, and that's, that's, I think, the, the most powerful part. When I look back on semesters that I taught for, that's, that's the, the feeling that I remember and the magic that I remember. But with all of that, the magic is really you. Um, so your daughter or you will be the person that is helping the traveling school's mission come to life. You are laughing alongside your classmates every day. You are studying alongside them. You're eating alongside them. You're working together on challenge courses and outdoor adventures that might not always feel easy. This picture could have very easily been taken while it was raining. And um, you also had a project earlier that morning that was stressing you out. But the beauty is that this semester with its challenges really teaches you to lean on um, the people that are a part of it with you. And that brings me to my last little plug before I turn it over to Gracie and Mary. But Carly Lloyd, who was on semester just a few years ago, I think said it really beautifully. She says, I feel like the traveling school didn't change who I was, but helped me become who I wanna be and transformed the way I move through the world. The traveling school left me feeling more like myself than ever, more confident, more empowered, and more curious. Um, she says her advice to you as prospective students, as prospective families, don't be afraid to take this leap. Don't put limits on what you think your next school year could look like. We need people who are more compassionate, thoughtful and strong to lead the shift towards a better future. And of course that at the traveling school is our ultimate goal. We want these girls to leave ready to enact change, positive change um, in the communities that they leave back home. And I think with this Western US semester, we've just seen our mission come to life even more beautifully. Um, while we do get international students every semester, we also see the beauty of what it looks like to have the communities that you're learning about be the communities that you also identify with. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen 
and allow Gracie and Mary to be spotlighted because they are just wonderful. And I'm so grateful that they're here um, this evening. So Gracie and Mary, um, first Gracie, I just wanted to ask you and really Mary, you can chime in as well, but what led you to even discovering that the traveling school existed? And can you speak a little bit to your journey about finding it, but then also deciding that it was the right pivot for you? Um, yeah, and you can take that wherever you'd like to go with it. Um, so I guess my personal experience with it, the way that I found the traveling school was, um, I, w I have always been desiring to do something along the lines of a study abroad program, especially in high school. Um, because I grew up with a lot of role models who did something very similar. So I just was so, I was so passionate about it. I really, really wanted to find a way to entertain that in my school career at a young age before like I hit college and had to start making a lot of more like big kid decisions, I guess. So the way that I found the traveling school was by going to one of my um, local like study abroad fairs. And there was a person there with a booth set up and I just kind of like sat and talked down to this, sat down and talked with this person for, I don't know, it couldn't have been more than like 30 minutes, but just something about like her energy for it. I think she was a parent of one of her, one of the alumnas and just sitting there and being able to hear her self-reflection of it, not only hers, but also her daughter's um, as they went through the process of the traveling school really, really kind of stuck with me. And even though at first I was like, oh, well, I'm the, at first I didn't think it was exactly what I was looking for. It didn't seem to suit like 100% what I wanted, but I kept it on the back burner, like because of how, like be, because of how much that single conversation that I had with this woman impacted me. Um, and it kind of just ended up like everything else fell away and it just was like the beacon. <laughs> and um, the more I thought about it, the more I realized it fit my personality and it fit exactly what I wanted to do and what I was looking for. So that that's kind of how I gravitated towards a traveling school for, it happened within a couple months, definitely. Great, thank you. Mary, anything to add to that? Yeah, I cool. think you know, when you have, we had, um, and Grace is referring to, we've hosted seven international exchange students and we've had girls who've lived a year with us. So she was initially trying to figure out how to spend a year abroad somewhere. Um, and then our high school was um, a bit challenging is a nice way of putting it regarding credit hours and everything else. So we started looking at half year programs. She had had this beautiful conversation with the traveling school and it narrowed it down real quick to what she wanted to do. She didn't wanna to go to a foreign country and not be able to speak the language. She didn't wanna to go to England. She didn't wanna do any things like that. And she just thought the traveling school, I get to make my own family in the traveling school. I'm gonna have sisters, I'm gonna have teachers. This is gonna be perfect for me. And it was a done deal mm -hmm. at that point. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Gracie, I know you were a rock star when it comes to fundraising. Can you mm. speak a little bit to that process and any other challenges kind of that you faced when thinking about, could you make it happen? How can you make it happen? And what that felt like. Mm -hmm. And if you want me to share the prop, Grace, I can do that. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the hardest part for fundraising, the way I like to describe it, is that I'm very glad I got the experience because it taught me a lot about perseverance and how to like persist on, but it was also incredibly difficult. Um, and I am very proud of the way that I approached it, kind of what Maddie was saying. I think a lot of what I did was um, ver very much just finding a way that kept me motivated to keep working for it, um, especially kind of like looking with the end goal in mind. And I'll specify with that, but kind of my fundraising process started um, in. February, March, probably, and it ended by August. So it kind of that time frame was when I fundraised. And it was a lot of connections. Um, it was a lot of reaching out to people consistently of planning events. And Matt, Maddie, I'm not sure how specific you want me to go. But um, it was just, it, yeah, it was a lot of work. And it was definitely very challenging. But I think the biggest piece of advice I could give with fundraising is that creating um a visual and mother, if you want to turn your camera on and bring out the prop, <laughs> but uh, creating a um, a visual for me. And I actually have a story behind this. So I'm not sure how you can see it, but um, what my mom's bringing right now, it's a big board that says Africa Sushi 100. <laughs> and the, what it represented to me was um, 
the, one of my favorite restaurants, sushi is my favorite food and one of my favorite restaurants ever, like when my whole family went one night, it would be about a hundred dollars. So the way it kind of started to symbolize it was every hundred dollars I earned was one meal at Mr. Tokyo. So at the very beginning of the fundraising process and I was really feeling down and I just felt like, oh, there's no way I can do this. This is too overwhelming. I printed out like a million different like individual sushi rolls. And then for every hundred dollars, I colored one in to show like to keep that up on a board so that every day I could look at it and I could visually see the progress I was making. And that made me like learn to appreciate every $5 I got, every $25 I got. And like, if somebody gave me $50, it was an amazing day. And like, it just, it, and it was so fun, like picking my colors for the sushi rolls, you know, I just like kind of learned to have fun with it and learn to really um, personalize it, I guess, and make it something you can visually see because I think it helps so much more than just mentally keeping a number in your head or like seeing it on a piece of paper. Um, so that would be my biggest piece of advice, I guess, is find a way to, if not, if it not visually to remind you, just like whatever emotional support you need to be able to look at your accomplishments and be proud of yourself for what you've done. Because I think like keeping that pride is what really kept me motivated and made me want to keep going and keep achieving more. And Grace raised $26,000 to go. So she yeah. worked really hard and it was fundraising. It was, we did an African dinner. We did a garage sale. We reached out to her old school teachers. We did, we did a whole lot of different things and the traveling school did a great job giving recommendations on how to help us do that. So mm -hmm. it really made the trip possible. And I think with that, I'll just add that one of our priorities at the traveling school is to not make these cohorts feel one-dimensional or representing just a very small cut of our population. Um, I think the beauty of the semesters that I was on, but even just the one that's in the field right now, we have a girl from Tel Aviv, Israel on our semester, seeing the Western U.S. for the first time. On me and Gracie's semester, we had a French-speaking gal from Montreal, Canada, who had never been in classes um, using English before. And we also had a gal, you know, from Detroit, Michigan, who was used to being homeschooled because her public school system was failing her. And watching all of these types of people come together and the through line really that I noticed and felt on a daily basis was this gratitude um, and also this immense just hunger to explore something different with academics, be pushed, be more challenged and find people who might be really different from them, but who they can connect with on this deep level. Um, and in turn, redefine what girlhood feels like, redefine what community feels like, redefine what family feels like and redefine what role models look like. Because like I was saying earlier, um, you know, your teachers are not just your teacher, they are also there for the ride every every day. We are there, um, sleeping in tents alongside you, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of magic to what types of people we want to bring together. And if you are a family that would need some financial assistance, um, first of all, definitely start the conversation about applying for a scholarship. And then also know that if that award is not the amount that you need, we also want to support you in making it happen because, um, yeah, I think the beauty of these semesters is that it's not all just people who have already been afforded travel experiences, have already done a billion summer camps. Um, and they're also not people who have always, you know, done a lot of outdoorsy things. And that's great too. We want to support every type of girl and being able to make this possible. Um, Gracie, getting back into your semester, can you describe a moment when you thought to yourself, you know, yes, I'm supposed to be here. Yes, this is what I should be doing. Um, the best way I actually I when I read this question and I sat there and I pondered for so long to try to think of a single moment that I could define in which I genuinely felt like, oh, yes, this is it. But the way that I realized it happened was that it happened like gradually over time and it kind of just like kept building and building and building into a feeling of like belonging. There was never like I never really had one aha moment, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that's kind of magical for me. I just remember one day suddenly like looking around like at the other girls and going like, holy crap, like this is my family, you know? And I like, it was just the coolest feeling ever of being able to look around and know like, wow, these people know me better than I feel like I know myself. And really um, being able to like 
to, to genuinely feel the effects that not only the school was having on me and like the teachers and the amazing places we were going and the people we were talking to, but just everything kind of accumulating into one ball. And I, I'd say the specific moment I could come up with was quite literally the very last night before we flew out. Um, all of I, I was on a semester with 11 other girls. So there were 12 of us and all of us were sitting in the living room of this hostel and the teachers had all gone to bed. They were all sleeping because they had to be up way earlier than we were, but we were all just like staying up, talking, like signing each other's t-shirts and like giving each other music recommendations when we got home and just like a lot of little things and like painting each other's nails. Like it was just like a bunch of random, it literally felt like a sleepover. <laughs> and in our kind of states of mind where we were trying to process the fact that like, oh my gosh, everything's ending tomorrow it just felt truly magical to be able to like look around this room and know that every single one of these people I'd connected with. And it just like that, that that's when I would say was my moment of, oh my gosh, like this was exactly what I needed. And I feel so full right now, just like a glass full of water. And, um, but, but I can't, other than that, I can't think of like a single moment just because it builds on you. So gradually, you, you, a lot of times you don't even realize it's happening <laughs> until you have the aha moment. Love it. Um, can you also share, Gracie, a little bit about, um, big picture ways that you feel like the traveling school impacted your life and Mary, feel free to chime in as well. And, and these can be, you know, perhaps a moment when you felt like you had that shift, but probably more realistically, it was also gradual, um, as you started to make college decisions and gap year decisions, et cetera. Yeah, so this was a really hard question for me for a really long time because I feel like it's so hard, like you were saying, it's so hard to define exactly how I feel like I changed because I know I changed, but I just like couldn't put words to it. And I think the way that I finally settled was um, like, I, I guess one of the biggest changes that I noticed in myself was that number one, I was so incredibly excited about the concepts that I knew like basically nothing about the world and about people. Like just knowing how, even though I'd done all these things and had seen all these places, like there was still an infinite number of other things I could do and see and people I could meet and talk to. And rather than that being scary to me, which had previously, you know, I feel like most people see that as a little intimidating that like, you can never really get an answer for everything. But to me, that was like the most exciting thing in the world um, because it meant that I had more places to go and more people to talk to. So just that shift in perspective was definitely one of the major things where I just feel like I'd matured so much as an adult. Um, and as like a young woman traveling, I felt much more confident in my own intellect and my own educational abilities, as well as just my communication skills and being able to connect with somebody regardless of their backstory, where they're from. Um, but also just, I became so like, huh, how do I describe it? <laughs> um, I love doing things that scare me a little bit now because the traveling school and the concept of it was like, I was so excited. And then the day before I left hit and I was terrified. I was so scared. Like my mom could tell you I could barely eat. Like I was freaking out because it suddenly hit me all at once what I was doing and just how intimidating that was because I'd never done anything like that before. But then once I did it and I came back and I felt so much stronger as a human being, just knowing that this scared me and I did it and it was amazing has led me to make a lot of decisions that I don't think I would have made if I hadn't gotten that experience of figuring out that like doing the things that scare you are the way you grow the most. Um, and that's the best way to like gain experience almost is like, if they don't scare you a little, then I feel like you don't really change from it because you don't learn and you don't grow. So that, that's probably the biggest way that I've changed is I've become much more attracted to things that scare me a little. <laughs> Mary, do you have any perspective to <laughs> perhaps, um, help other parents in the room say that their, their daughters aren't going to come back just ready to be scared all the time but rather no probably. it's a good it's a good kind of scared you know what I mean it's not the bad kind of scared where she's afraid to open up the door although when we were leaving the hotel room to meet everybody that first day when we were all getting I literally had to push her out the door and right there was Arden with all the books and Grace had to flip it right there and she was fine from that moment on but before that she was a mess um, which is hard <laughs> to believe. Um, I think for her, what I noticed, she came back with such a sense of 
confidence, poise, um, excitement, just everything. And I think for me to watch this girl who is 16 years old come home, um, have to deal with everything, trying to get back into school and literally being in school for five weeks before COVID shut everything down. So she went from exploring Africa to being in her her room, you know what I mean, for next year and a half of classes. Um, it just to be able to see that transition and her being able to keep centered and grounded and knowing that education is important, that this too shall pass. This is that she had that, I don't know, that skill set that I didn't see before. She always had the potential in a sense, but I think she gained that experience much earlier by this experience at traveling school and by the incredible teachers that you guys are. I mean, she felt safe with you. She learned everything she learned at the traveling school. She still knows because it wasn't memorization. It was experiential. It was in her bones and she's confident to be able to go out into the world to even like the gap year that she's taking now and then her plans for when she's at college and then spending a couple of years in Singapore, finishing up college. She's very comfortable with that whole plan in her life right now. And I think the traveling school just gave her that confidence because she did something that most people look at her and go, the first thing, did you see any animals? And then the next question, aren't you scared? Weren't you scared? And she's like, yes, no. You know, I mean, and then moved on to it. So it was an incredible experience for her that the growth that she had from no technology, talking, building relationships with a bunch of women she did not know and knowing that. And she came out this beautiful creature. I'm so proud of her. Oh, thank you so much for hearing. <laughs> and I feel that part as well, just across, you know, the 15 weeks, but I, still follow a lot of my students and their journeys and um, keep in touch as best as I can. And I think you watch the the growth that happens on semester, like Mary was saying, just continue on and on. Um, and the messages that I get, I remember Gracie Katie texted me the other day and was like, oh my gosh, we just read Pedagogy of the Oppressed in my history class. But the teacher, you know, said it in all these ways that was just not very captivating. And I didn't really get it as much, but then I was the one that was teaching everyone about it afterwards at study hall because, uh, you know, they just, they weren't like living it. Um, and I loved, I loved hearing that, but with that, I wanted to start having you all, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type them in the chat. These can be nuts and bullets questions. You know, Gracie, tell us about how your credits were transferred. I'm having trouble with that at my school, um, or some bigger picture abstract questions. And while you're all typing those in my last question for you both is just, what advice, what words of wisdom do you have for these folks who um, might be on the fence or are just trying to learn more about us before they, they take the next step? Uh, words of advice, okay. Um, I guess I feel like you hear this all the time, but my biggest word of advice is literally like, take that leap, take that chance. Like it's an opportunity you will remember for the rest of your life. And it's something that I know I will remember for the rest of my life. And it genuinely changed, like the, it, it changed so much about me. It changed my perception of the world. It changed how I want to approach my future. It changed how I approach people, like just everything about me, I feel like was slightly altered in a such an important and inspiring way through just 15 weeks of being with these women who I knew were also as passionate about education with I was and also like these amazing teachers taking me these amazing places and teaching me these amazing things and sincerely like I I just I have no other word than just like if you have the chance and you have the courage and the passion like just do it because you will never ever ever regret it and not a single day have I looked back and wished that anything was different like I adored every second I spent there and it will forever be very treasured to me. Um, our experience with our high school was they tried to talk us out of an exchange program, um, any type of exchange, because she wouldn't be able to take all these AP classes she should take to be able to get in college. And she wouldn't be taking her uh, you know, SAT, pre-SATs, her beginning of her junior year. And it's going to be hard for her to graduate, all these kind of these arguments, and we had started that from eighth grade, and by not listening to that and figuring it out, um, she, the AP classes didn't matter at all. She got accepted everywhere she applied to college, 
Um, she didn't get any rejection. She chose what the best opportunities were. It was the experience that she had, the eloquence with what she learned. So I think sometimes schools want you to be able to say, you have to take so many APs to get into these top schools. It's not necessarily the case for that. So I just want, don't let that be fearful because that's how our school tried to handle it. Um, do it. If your daughter is interested in this, really take a close look at it. Talk to Maddie closer about it in the traveling school you will be so it's probably the best thing that we were able to do for grace and i'm so excited for her and um just just love it but yeah just talk to the traveling school they'll help you with transfer credits and they'll they'll help you with all that kind of stuff really um and thanks for those of you who asked some questions in the chat um Lena, in short, your question about our region, I think we will be at least programming in the Western US that for this coming spring and next fall and spring. Um, we like to shift regions. Like I was saying at this point, we've been to a few different continents. And I think once we develop those partnerships, have strength in our curriculum and get to believe the work that we're doing while we're there. And I think especially with the Western US, it's like, yeah, if a lot of these girls are coming from this country, it is um, important to our mission that they are critically looking at their own country and their own origin and privileges and figuring out how to enact change in the places that they call home. Um, that said, we do love our Africa partners and our South America partners, and we love the um, the different cultural immersion. I don't want to minimize the cultural immersion that we can get from the Western US. I think there's so much to learn about the regions that we'll be going through, you know, just landscape alone, let alone the different demographics that you'll be seeing. And we love that Spanish immersion that we get in South America. Um, we love the cultural pieces that you get when you are traversing through five different countries in Southern Africa. Um, you know, culturally, yes, Zambia is very different than South Africa and the politics there and the history there. It's just, um, it is, it's pretty incredible to be able to bring to life all of these different regions through our curriculum. So I think for at least next year, we're going to be domestic. And then um, we will likely go back to Southern Africa and South America in the next couple of years. But um, yeah, we're going to just ride out this Western U.S. Uh, program for as long as it feels like it's doing the work. And right now it is doing that. Um, Mary, you've got a question here. We love the no technology aspect of the program, but realize that means contact is then limited. How is it for you in terms of staying informed on how things are going with the program? Actually, when, when Grace was in Africa, we got about a phone call every three to four weeks. So we probably talked four times over the 15 weeks. Um, but what was wonderful is that um, Maddie and the rest of the teachers, there's a private like family group of information that they would load up assignments, they would post pictures, they would say what they'd been doing that week. Um, we would get emails about their grades, you know, like their evaluations every month, What the because the, the teachers meet with the girls, they're also their mentors. So we got a lot of information, even though we didn't necessarily talk to her all the time, we knew kind of where she was a little bit delayed. They always let us know, you know, when we thought she was at, you know, Elephant Sands, they were actually had moved from there. So a little bit delayed as to where they were, but never it was always great when we got that 30 minute phone call and got up to date, but we already knew what was kind of happening in her life to be able to answer, ask her questions about things. And then she could go, oh yeah, with the elephants, some of the girls got locked in the bathroom because the elephants wouldn't let them out. You know what I mean? <laughs> so we were able to ask those kinds of questions because there was, like I said, this blog that was specifically for the families and the teachers would keep us informed with with um, notes and, and everything else like that. So I never felt like I was not in touch with what was going on. I just wasn't personally talking to Grace and it was so much fun to read all that stuff. The teacher is really fabulous with how they wrote. So it was great. Grace didn't actually have any problems with no technology. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> she, except when her MP3 player broke, that was a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll add to we um, a couple times across the semester will give mentor comments, which are both on the emotional, social, physical well-being level of our mentees, um, but we'll also have academic comments. So halfway through the semester and at the end of the semester, each teacher will be writing 
fairly robust comments about, you know, Gracie's I am from poem was so beautiful because it mentioned this thing. And um, I'm encouraging her to speak more in class. That wasn't true for Gracie, but we'll, <laughs> we'll really get, we'll get into the depth of how they're performing academically, how they're doing just as a human. Um, and those kinds of letters I think are helpful as well. In addition to, yeah, that blog. Um, Gracie, do you want to speak to how it felt to be on the move while completing assignments and doing honors level homework, et cetera? Yeah, it was definitely very different. Um, I think I personally don't remember having troubles adapting to it, which is very interesting. I thought one of the biggest things I thought would be a major change was switching from my perspective of a classroom, kind of like Maddie said earlier, like my only image of a classroom was four walls in a school building, but it was so easy to flip that switch and like go into a more natural rhythm of you know like okay we're on the move today we're uh, like we're rafting down the Zambezi we're going to pull over and have travel journalism for an hour and a half um and I feel like that was a very easy switch to flip because of a combination of number one just how exciting it was for that like for a new perspective like that to happen also like how interesting the classes were and like everybody there was just excited to learn. So I think that made it a very easy transition as well. Um, moving from like being in a stationary to being in a mobile uh, school environment, but it really, it wasn't a as dramatic as I thought it'd be. <laughs> it, honestly, it was very simple and um, it definitely became a lot sometimes like to manage and keep track. But I think more than anything versus being overwhelming it more just helped me in developing like my time management skills and my attention managing skills for lack of a better term, uh, like dedicating my time to knowing, okay, I have this, I have these things I need to do today. I'm gonna set aside the time for this and then I'll still have time to read my book later today. Um, and I think the fact that there's no technology also made that a lot easier because like obviously te technology is a very distracting element and it's very easy just to get on and waste like hours doing something random. So I think, in removing that completely from my environment. It not only made me more invested in my schoolwork, but also kind of opened up that time um, for a lot of not only like work and being able to physically move with it, but also just kind of bonding and also like doing all my chores if I needed to do laundry or something random like that, or I needed to take a shower or whatever. Um, yeah, so I'd say that was probably the the biggest thing was just, it taught me a lot of time management and it was definitely um, a switch, but not a challenging one, if that makes sense. I think it's just kind of like forced to adapt to your environment and it was not a hard adaption to make. Great. Um, and for Wenda's question, Gracie, I forget, what span did you have in terms of grades? Like two soft? So, yeah, so I think, I think there were two or three Probably, probably more than that. There, there are two or three to four <laughs> um, sophomores. So they were 15 going on 16. And then um, there are a couple of people my age who are juniors um, who are 16 going on 17. And I think there was one, I think Alex was the only one that was 17 to 18. So it kind of ranged from 15 to 17 was I'd say the major age range. I don't think there was anybody older or younger than that. Yeah. And then I think, um, for context, I think traditionally we get predominantly juniors, couple sophomores, and then I know that this spring we already have more seniors than um, is normal for us. And yeah, that is what we've got for you all. If there are any lingering questions and you have a couple more minutes to stay with us, please send them along. And I'll also just say um, we are all ready to answer more questions. And so please, yeah, get in touch. I think at this point you should all have my phone number, um, my email I'll put in the chat as well. And I know it's a, it's a big concept to wrap your heads around. So we're happy to provide some more perspectives and um, whether it's Gracie and Mary or other alumna and their families, we're always happy to make those connections because I think that their perspective is really helpful, um, especially when it just comes to the nitty gritty questions like, how often did you talk to your daughter and how did that feel? Mm -hmm. Maddie, do you want me to put um, my email in chat and if they want to talk to me? Sure. That'd be awesome. All right. 
Yeah, because I know I wasn't able to talk much about my specific fundraising process. So if you guys have questions about um, specifically like what exactly I did for fundraising, I'm happy to answer those questions and talk about like my like my legitimate step-by-step -step experience and what I did with it, or just if there's any other like general questions for me. Yeah, and I'll clarify, we are right now still accepting applications for this coming spring semester um, and admissions for the following fall. So fall 2020, fall 2022 <laughs> um, and spring 2023 will, the application is, deadline is February 15th, but we want to make sure that everyone that gets accepted is the right fit. So um, we'll continue in a rolling admissions period until that is the case. And again, here are some emails. If you haven't already, start following us on social media. That's another way that you can stay up to date. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate it and are looking forward to more conversations with you all. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night.